thank you for coming today to join us on this webinar. We uh, at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, we have a lot of information to share with you about a little bit about beekeeping, but a little bit more about how to create habitat for bees, for butterflies and other pollinators. So tonight we have the expert from the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, Pete Berthelsen. He's our partnership director, and he's gonna talk to you about how to create pollinator habitat that'll be helpful for your bees. Pete. All right. Thanks, Elsa. <clears throat> Looking forward to chatting with everybody tonight. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and uh, get ready to have a chat tonight about how a nonprofit that most of you have maybe never heard of before called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund can support your beekeeping efforts. Pretty important uh, issue. So with that, I'll jump into our presentation and you've just met two people that are helping give the presentation tonight. Myself, Pete Berthelsen, and then Elsa Gallagher and Elsa is our Habitat program coordinator. And one of the things that she'll be doing is providing one-on-one -on -one technical guidance for all of the projects that we work on. So many of you that are interested in what we're talking about tonight might get to know Elsa real well. So started out with something that probably everybody listening to this webinar already knows. Bees and pollination are really important for the food, uh, that we eat and lots of things related to our environment. And there's just some examples of some interesting quotes that are up here, but we know that bees are a really important part of our environment. And I think that this is a really unique moment in time where a very, very high percentage of the public understands that there are problems with honeybees, monarch butterflies and, and this group of insects that we call pollinators. <clears throat> and I don't think there's probably any better example of what a unique moment in time this is than when you have the New York Times writing articles about monarch butterflies and where that population sits right now. This is a unique moment in time in that when the public has this heightened level of understanding and concern and desire to do something about it, that offers some unique opportunities. And one of those um, thoughts that I wanna lay out as a foundation right here is that when we call something pollinator habitat, probably the vision that everybody kind of gets in their mind is the photo on the calendar in your office when you flip the page to the month of July, this gorgeous flowering meadow and pollinator habitat can look like that. It can look like lots of other things, and we'll kind of look at some of those examples tonight. But to get to imagery like this does not happen overnight, uh, and it needs to follow a strategic plan, and that's one of the things that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund works on with beekeepers and others to accomplish. Before we go any further in the conversation tonight, I wanna to give you a couple of foundational thoughts that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund kind of approaches this issue with. And the first is that not all pollinator habitat is created equal. Just because a plant produces a flower doesn't mean that it has a terribly high pollinator value. So not all pollinator habitat is equal. The other foundational thought is that if we try to solve things like uh, honeybee health and uh, monarch butterfly population recovery and just different things like that, if we try to solve them using the same set of tools that we've used for the last decade or two, we will fail we will not be successful. We have to look at things a little bit differently. And here's a graph that most beekeepers are pretty familiar with. This is a graph that shows over the last about 15 years, what the annual honeybee hive losses are in the United States. <clears throat> and unfortunately, we've been experiencing 
between 40 and 60 percent annual losses for some time now. There's lots of reasons for that. They're all complicated. But one of the things that's really important to know is that this line represents the losses that can be sustained and beekeeping remain viable. If you were a commercial beekeeper, that line at 15% is about the number of annual losses that you can deal with and still remain sustainable. So think of you know, how many businesses or professions or industries would remain sustainable with a 40 to 60% annual loss. Very, very hard to accomplish. And, and that's not limited to just honeybees. Uh, here's uh, one of our more iconically recognized insect species in the country, the monarch butterfly. And monarch butterfly populations for the Eastern monarch butterfly population in the US can be estimated each winter when the monarchs travel to a particular mountaintop in central Mexico and they estimate the population. Well, one of the things that we know is that for that population to remain sustainable, we need to have a population that is at that line. Six hectares uh, is the size. And we know that we have been well below that for far too long. And so it's another example of, if we're gonna try and solve this problem related to honeybees or monarch butterflies using the same tools and strategies that we've been using for the last 15 years, well, it hasn't been working. So it's not gonna be successful and we need to look at it a little bit differently. One more example of where we have to look at doing things differently is a collection of birds, bird species, that we refer to as grassland songbirds. And this is a group of birds that have received upwards of 90% population declines over the last 40 years. And like most things, whether it's honeybees or monarch butterflies or grassland songbirds, the one thing that we can control is habitat. And that's probably that one of the biggest factors that has been influencing things. So we don't have enough habitat on the landscape. So another foundational philosophy that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has is when we get an acre of habitat, we need to make it the best habitat that it can be. We don't have enough acres of it. So when we get one, we can't we, we just can't afford to get by with, nah, nah, you know, it's, it's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. We need to have the very best habitat out there on the landscape that we can. So take those foundational philosophies and then bring in this young nonprofit that most of you have probably never heard of before called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And here is a unique nonprofit that offers this level of support. We provide free pollinator seed mixtures, and we'll talk about those in just a minute, on projects that are two acres in size or larger. The project can happen on private land, public land, or corporate land. And we would encourage you to consider that to be any kind of land. Uh, it's a simple online application. And then we provide one-on-one -on -one technical guidance to fully prepare your site and make it a success. And one of the really, really unique, innovative aspects of the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund, and I say innovative because Elsa and I have been working on conservation programs our entire career, uh, a lot of years, many decades, and we know of no other conservation program that takes this approach. And that is that when we work on a project, we provide two different seed mixtures, which we're gonna describe for you right here. One of which is referred to as a honeybee mix. It includes the plant species that honeybees and native bees and all kinds of butterflies really look for and thrive on. It includes clover species. And then the other half of the project is planted to a seed mixture that we call a monarch butterfly mixture. 
very high diversity, a minimum of 40 wildflower species in it, all native wildflowers, uh, all native plants in there. And we provide two different seed mixtures. So the honeybee mixture establishes very, very quickly. This is literally a photograph of a plant in two months after it was planted. Establishes very quickly and all kinds of pollinator species will use and benefit from it. The monarch butterfly mixture establishes at a very different pace. Sometimes we use the saying, in year one, it sleeps. In year two, it creeps. And in year three, the planting leaps. Sleeps, creeps, leaps. It establishes much slower. Both mixtures provide tremendous value, but they are designed to establish very differently. So we plant them in separate plantings in the same project, okay? Very unique approach that we take to solving that issue. So the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund works on habitat projects all over the country, but kind of our flagship pollinator habitat program is called Seed a Legacy. And in the Seed a Legacy program, we currently make this offering of providing free seed mixtures and all that sort of thing in a 12 state region. And time out right now, because for everybody that's watching the webinar and is like, well, I, I'm not in one of those 12 states. Know that when we started, we were in two states, then we went to six states, then we went to 10 states, now we're at 12 states and we're on the cusp of making our next expansion and adding in more states. So we're coming if we're not there yet. If you are from a state that this particular program is not available yet and you're like, I would really love to see this program that you're gonna learn more about in just a second, come to my state, pick up the phone, give us a call, and let's have a conversation about how we could bring the Seed a Legacy program to your state even quicker. So how did we pick those 12 states that we're in right now? Well, <clears throat> we picked them for a number of reasons, but probably two overriding reasons. The first is their critical importance to commercial beekeeping, okay? And this is um, a map that probably most beekeepers are familiar with that kind of shows the pollination service travel route that commercial beekeepers use throughout a year. And the other really important reason why we picked those 12 states is the Eastern Monarch Butterfly Population Recovery. And if you've never seen this map before and are like, I'm not sure what that means. So east of the Rocky Mountains is the Eastern Monarch Butterfly Population. And if you happen to live in an area that is red, orange, or yellow, you are in the most critical part of the country for the Eastern Monarch Butterfly Population Recovery. What happens in your area determines how that population goes forward uh, and succeeds. So really important part of the country with all that red in every one of those states is where we're working right now. So two seed mixtures, very innovative and unique approach, very different seed mixtures. They establish differently. Uh, well, how, what does a project look like? How would that happen? Well, here's a couple examples that Elsa and I put together for you. In this example, we have somebody that has a six acre area that wants to do a project. And in this example, you could go in and you could just plant half of it on one side of the field and half of it on the other side of the field pretty straightforward and that can work. But you could also take a more innovative approach and take that same six acre field and around the outside of the field, plant three acres of our honeybee mix and in the center of that field, three acres of the monarch butterfly mix. And if you're looking at that and it's like, yeah, so I, you know, what's, what's the deal there? Well, think about that honeybee mix 
acting as a green fire break for your future management of the habitat project. Think of it like a castle with a moat around it. The green fire break, the honeybee mix, acts as an additional safety mechanism so that when we add prescribed fire in the future as a management tool to our monarch butterfly mix planting, we're able to put fire on the ground in a much more safe and effective manner because fire is an absolutely great management tool for some of our pollinator plantings going forward. Okay, so now one more example. If you're listening to this webinar and you're like, well, I don't have six acres, I don't even have two acres. Well, know that we work real hard to find a reason to say yes to a project. And we'll do projects where if you have an acre and your neighbor has an acre uh, or several neighbors have a, you know, pieces that we can add together, we will uh, count those towards the two acre minimum uh, if they have a very high likelihood of having a good pollinated outcome. So think about the land across the fence from your property as well. So I, always, I already kind of referred to this, but uh, Elsa works really hard to find a reason to say yes to doing a project. We strive very hard for there to not be a programmatic reason why we would say, no, sorry, we can't do a project. We strive very hard to make sure that we're not saying no because you don't have a cropping history or uh, any reasons like that. Um, if the project has a high likelihood of producing a good pollinator outcome, we work really hard to find a reason to say yes to work with you, okay? This is uh, a really good time for us to tell you about a free resource that if you're interested in putting pollinator habitat on the ground, that can help you. And that is our pollinator habitat establishment and management guide. This free document takes you through step by step all of the many different aspects of site preparation, seed selection, how to plant, when to plant, how to manage it going forward. So ELSO provides one-on-one -on -one technical guidance, but we also have lots of resources available for you to help you get it right because perhaps the most important factor that will determine the success of any pollinator project is the site preparation that goes into that project. Here's an example of what we mean by that. We have a site preparation method that we refer to as the gold plan. And the gold plan is called that because it is the best site preparation method that we know out there. And here's an example of a project that we're doing that's actually located within a city on a vacant lot. And the gold plan, and, and this might be for folks listening, it's like, what, what, How, why would you do that? And the gold plan is actually taking that area that you want to do your pollinator planting and plant it to soybeans for one growing season. So the, in this photo right here with the houses in the background, uh, the vacant lot that was just grass and the, and the landowner right back here in this house went out and had to mow it every 10 days throughout the summer. They wanted to have pollinator habitat. Their neighbors uh, were excited about it. So <clears throat> we terminated the grasses, planted it to soybeans for one growing season, and then that fall, we've planted our pollinator uh, planting into this project. So why would we do that? Well, number one, we're able to fully and completely terminate the grasses. That means both the grass that's growing above ground and the root system of the grasses below ground. The soybeans naturally fix nitrogen into the soil which will give your new pollinator planting a big boost. And you create a phenomenal seed bed to plant into that fall. 
our habitat establishment guide right here walks you through all kinds of options, not just the gold plan, but the gold, the silver, and the bronze plan, and a number of other uh, activities, but the gold plan will certainly be where we kind of start and then work down from there for habitat establishment. This is a good moment in time to probably also say what we are not. And what the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is not is a prairie restoration program. And I feel like I have to give a disclaimer on this because both Elsa and I are prairie native grassland biologists. It's our passion. It's uh, what our background and experience is in. So we're strong proponents of that, but the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund Seed a Legacy program is not a prairie restoration program. Okay. <clears throat> so here, as you're thinking about this, we want to kind of wrap up this part of the webinar, and then we're really excited about taking some of your questions tonight. We, we want you to think about the many opportunities that are out there for collaboration. So if you're a beekeeper and you want your bees to have access to healthy forage, highly nutritious forage, highly diverse, like you see in this image right here. Here's some examples of the kind of projects that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has worked on. And I want you to think about these as you're looking at these images and think, hey, that, that could happen in my area. I know, I know where that could happen. So the first sort of collaboration, the bread and butter of what the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund does is we work with private landowners. And we work with private landowners to put in high quality projects. This happens to be a project from Minnesota that followed the gold plan to produce phenomenal results. And this photo was taken 15 months after it was planted. Highly diverse, the landowner uh, is a beekeeper as well, thrilled with the results of their project. And in 15 months, that's a pretty gorgeous uh, looking project. Pretty important moment to say that we like to find ways to work with agriculture. Here's an example of an active agricultural field in which we established a border of pollinator habitat. In the background is a soybean field, and in the foreground is the part of the buffer that pollinator habitat that's established around the field. There will be folks out there, other organizations, individuals that are like, eh, I, I don't know that I really want my pollinator habitat located next to agriculture because I'm very worried about the chemicals that are applied and the damage that it could do to pollinators. Yep, certainly a consideration, but our consideration and thought process at the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund is one, we'll take an acre of pollinator habitat wherever we can get it, because there's not enough of it on the landscape. And number two, when we get an acre of habitat, we need to make it the best that it can be. And that those benefits will outweigh any potential negatives associated with being planted next to agriculture. Renewable energy, uh, in this example, solar energy, is one of the really exciting areas where we have tremendous opportunity to have pollinator health and habitat benefits included with a solar energy project. And when you look at any solar energy project like this one, perhaps the most important consideration is how high off the ground is the lower panel height. Because we want to design a seed mixture that will be planted under the panels that does not grow taller than the lower panel height. So the two seed mixture approach that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund takes works really, really well with solar energy. And here's an example of an actual solar energy project this one happens to be located in Ohio. 
and we took the two seed mixture approach. And every area in this photo that you see where you have the pink, here's the fence that goes around the project. These black squiggly lines are where the panels are. And all of this pink area is a mixture that was designed to go under the panels that doesn't grow tall than the lower panels. And that's our honeybee mix, okay? Specifically designed for that project. The areas of the project that you see that are in the green here are chunks of the project where there's not panels. So we don't have to worry about how tall the seed mixture will get. And that's where we provide the honeybee seed mixture for this project. That two seed mixture approach, that very innovative, effective seed mixture design approach that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund uses works great with solar energy projects. And we've currently been working on projects in 17 states, much bigger than the Seed Legacy 12 state boundary. So we do work outside of that. We provide technical guidance, uh, design the seed, either offer it free or heavily discounted. And we've worked on solar energy projects all the way from private individuals, all the way up to uh, utility and grid scale size projects. So here's my first challenge for everybody that's listening tonight. If you reside in a community or a county or a state where a solar energy project is coming to your area, be one of those people that raise your hand and ask the question, can we include pollinator benefits with this project? It can be done at no additional cost to the project. And if you think about something that could be providing hundreds of acres of a vegetative cover that provides pollinator health and habitat benefits, that is a huge, huge opportunity. And we need to get every solar project out there thinking about how to provide multiple benefits. Here's another example of the kind of collaboration that we work on. This is actually a corporation's land where they took a piece of ground associated with it, probably thinking about future expansion as the corporation grows, but it was all in grass. They had to mow it every seven to 10 days and they got together and decided, hey, we'd like to have pollinator habitat and this portion of their property is now established a pollinator habitat with a walking trail through it and benches so that the employees can take a break and go out there and enjoy wildflowers and grassland songbirds and bees and butterflies. And it's just a great addition to this corporate sustainability model that they have. Um, precision agriculture, pollinator habitat, can be a great tool to help keep agricultural chemicals out of our water system, like we have right here where we planted pollinator habitat along this creek, or we can identify portions of agricultural fields that underperform, costs more for our inputs and to try and grow crops on it than what we get out of it. Pollinator habitat can be an important component on increasing the return on investment in portions of that agricultural land. Here's an exciting one that we're, I, I don't know how many of these we're doing Elsa, but the number's increasing every day where we're working with municipalities on areas like, in this example, a wastewater treatment plant surrounded by grass and the municipality was going out there and mowing it every seven to 10 days. They've decided, one, we can reduce our costs by not having to mow that every seven to 10 days, and we can get a benefit for the community by establishing a chunk of this area to pollinator habitat. Um, we work with many state and federal wildlife agencies to establish pollinator habitat on public land. Utility right-of-ways, every state, every county, just about every area of the country has gas pipelines, utility 
uh, lines, things going through there that if established to pollinator habitat could be providing great benefits out there. Um, and then just kind of one of the last example is city parks, hike bike trails. Great examples of where uh, the community can benefit and get a lot of enjoyment out of it. And we can be promoting pollinator health and habitat. And I just kind of close this out by saying that pollinators and their habitat needs, I, I describe as a unique glue that can connect almost every kind of interest. If your interest is in water quality, soil health, food sustainability, beekeeping, monarch butterflies, grassland songbirds, on and on and on and on, renewable energy, pollinators and their health and habitat needs can connect to every single one of those things and many, many more issues as well. So it's a really unique uh, topic that can bring those folks together. So I wanna wrap this up with a quote from a good friend, commercial beekeeper named Zach Browning, fourth generation beekeeper uh, with a company called Browning's Honey. And uh, Zach and his company have participated with the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and have put multiple projects on the landscape, both on their land and on their um, tenants, their, their, their partners, the landowners where they bring hives and set up an apiary. They've also worked with those landowners to put in pollinator habitat. And Zach and Browning's Honey have seen tremendous benefits for both the health of their hives and the honey production. Two of the most important things for the sustainability of that industry and that business. And you can read Zach's quote there. So I wanna wrap this up by challenging everybody on the webinar tonight, Elsa. Here are a couple of things that everybody can do. It doesn't have to cost you anything. The first thing is whether you might have a project or you know somebody that might be interested in this, connect us with them. Let them know about the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund that they've probably never heard of before. And let's get lined up and let's support them with a project. Okay, that's number one. Number two is if you're part of a group, a beekeeping group or any kind of a group that is interested in something like this, get a hold of us. Let's co-host a webinar just like we did tonight and have a great conversation about it. Um, number three, if you think you know people that would be interested or you have an upcoming beekeeping meeting, a state beekeeping meeting, get a hold of us and we will give you flyers that promote the Seed Legacy program that you can hand out to people at your meeting. We would love to provide you with some of those. The next thing is, if you know anybody, you have a friend that has a birthday, an anniversary, um, a work accomplishment, uh, something that you wanna recognize them for, or perhaps a memorial gift, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, you name it, an event where you wanna provide somebody with a gift or a recognition, we have a, a option for you that I really want you to think about. It's called Gifts That Grow. And in Gifts That Grow, you can give any dollar amount that you want, but if you were to give a gift of $100, there would be a half acre of pollinator habitat established in that person's name. You design and create a unique e-certificate that you present to the person as their gift. So think of somebody that's having a birthday. Here's your birthday gift. You give them uh, the envelope and the e-certificate that is a card that tells them that a half an acre of pollinator habitat has been established in their name. Um, we love it because you give somebody a, a bouquet of flowers. Well, that lasts five days. Well, think about a gift that grows that is five years worth of 
uh, pollinator habitat like you've seen here tonight. Then the last thing, and this is really a freebie, follow us on social media. We're on all the channels, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, all of that stuff. Like and follow us, you'll be able to see more information about what we do, more success stories, video habitat tips for you. Uh, I think you'll really like the content. So with that, uh, I'm going to close this out and I'm going to turn this over to Elsa, who I think has been gathering questions tonight. And we're going to be able to start to answer your questions, which is really kind of the most important part of this whole webinar anyway. But this will show you how to uh, either email or call either Elsa or I or our general information uh, on our website. So with that, Elsa, thank you for the opportunity tonight. And I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Pete. That was some great information. And I know there's going to be a lot of questions in the audience here tonight as well. And I do want to encourage you that please use my email, elsa at bmbutterflyfund.org, to reach out with any questions that we leave unanswered for you tonight. Um, yeah. Write that down, jet it down, or you can send me a text or, or give me a phone call. But please ask those questions that we don't get to tonight. But with that, we're, I know we have a little bit of time left to answer some questions, Pete. So one that has come up quite a bit, um, and several people ask this question, is can you tell me how the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund came up with the idea of using two pollinator seed mixes? Um, most of these folks have never heard of another program that's taken that innovative approach. So yeah, what, how it, and why? Yeah, so <clears throat> it was one of the really innovative approaches that started at the beginning. And, you know, the conversation was, well, we want to benefit all pollinators. The Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund at its core was formed uh, by interest from commercial beekeepers, okay? So obviously honeybees were very, a very important component of what we're doing. How can we benefit honeybees specifically but we don't want to limit that benefit to just honeybees. So that approach of kind of two different seed mixtures, because we know the clover species are incredibly beneficial and desirable for honeybees, but also native bees. But we also wanted to be able to work on that aspect of having native wildflowers and that kind of benefit out there, because we know that grassland songbirds and just the widest range possible of critters and environmental benefits can be met by using that two seed mixture approach. So it was very innovative. And um, there's, a, there's a phrase that's out there today that's called an aha moment, right, Elsa? Yep. And I was not the person that came up with this idea. Wish I could claim credit. I was at the table, but when that idea came up for me personally, uh, as a wildlife biologist, it was like, wow, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time. And it's like, that is the perfect solution to how we can provide the most benefit possible for the widest range of species. Yep, it's uh, quite a unique thing. And we, uh, I, I love the way that when we put that together, Pete, we we can use that picture frame type approach with the honeybee on the outside. That just, it's just a unique thing. I think at that point, yep. um, we end up yeah. with that really nice uh, buffer between the pollinator, the high diversity yeah. mix, the monarch mix. Yeah. I'm going to go right back to it because it's that unique and cool. Uh, this is what else is talking about right here. The honeybee mix, that green fire break, uh, planting around the outside of the project, and then the monarch butterfly mix uh, in the middle. And, you know, maybe I didn't emphasize this enough, Elsa, when we were at this point in the presentation, but when you're working with a landowner, maybe I should let you tell this story, but I'm going to jump in and say part of it anyway. When you're working with a, a landowner or a corporation or a solar developer, you sit and listen to them and you ask lots of questions to learn what their objectives are and what they want the final product to look like, how it will function on 
uh, their site, uh, how they're going to be able to manage it in the future. And that's how you come up with innovative solutions and have come up with ideas like this with the, the castle with the moat around it that we referenced. And you want to just add any color to that, Elsa, about yeah, well, how you listen to folks and ask sure. a lot of questions? You know, and, and it might be the case, you know, we love to use this approach here, this, uh, this castle moat type approach, where that, then that honeybee mix can serve as that buffer between your, your high diversity native planting and the rest of what you had before, which could be crop, it could be brome grass or fescue grass. Um, it works as a really nice buffer to keep, keep that out, but it also works really great as that fire break. Um, it also works really well as a deer food plot. Uh, mm. Pheasant mm -hmm. and quail chicks love it. They are always mm. bringing their broods to, those, to that uh, green mix. Um, so it's, it's just really it depends on what the landowner is really interested in and, and what the resources are. In some cases, Pete, we've got a, um, a, a lady that I'm working with in um, Missouri that had two separate plots and one was very, very hard to get to and surrounded by woods. And it was an area that she probably wasn't going to burn much and it was a little more shaded. So we chose to use the honeybee mix there and then mm -hmm. use the uh, native mix, the monarch butterfly mix in a big, wider, open, sunnier area that um, had a little more ability to manage with fire in the future. Um, so, you know, it just really depends on what your goals are and what you're looking to do. And we help you develop the plan uh, based on what your needs are on that site and, you know, what that site is calling us to do to create that habitat for you. Right. Yeah. And, and the other, you know, part of what you just said that I'll emphasize is that's an innovative approach of where every single project is looked at and worked with individually. It, it, it's not a cookie cutter approach of, yeah, okay, you have to do this here and you have to do this there. There are, there are conservation programs like that. This one strives very hard to not be that way and to do what is going to produce the single best pollinator habitat and health outcome possible exactly it's uh it's we're innovative and we can really work with you to develop a plan that's right for your property and that's really what we want to we, we want you leaving here knowing that that that's our goal is to provide service for you so that you can get high quality pollinator habitat put on the ground um yeah it's, it's we're passionate about that that's what we want to do and, and we want to make you successful so Pete, I do have a few more questions before we finish up for the end of the uh, sure. evening tonight. So I do have a few questions about kind of beehives in specific, like how many can I put on my site and what recommendations do you have for being successful with my hives? I know you are a, a beekeeper and you have your own insights into what's been successful for you, but I also know that you work mm -hmm. with a lot of different beekeepers who have also done plantings uh, are being butterfly plantings on their sites with, through the Seed Legacy yeah. program. So if you could share some of those insights, I think that'd be yep. great. So <clears throat> that's a question. Some people refer to it as the stocking rate. You know, how many acres do I need for my hives to be healthy or how many hives can I put on an acre of being butterfly habitat fund plantings? And our estimate is that we can have about two hives per acre on a bee and butterfly habitat fund planting to provide all the forage and nutrition needs throughout the entire year, okay? The solid answer to that question is currently being researched by our friends at the University of Minnesota uh, Bee Lab and the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund and our uh, close friends at Project Apis M are supporting that project. And it's gonna be really exciting to come up with some real definitive answers. We, we have had other research projects out there uh, conducted by the US Geological Survey. They found that bee and butterfly habitat fund plantings provided more, significantly more pollinator value than any other conservation program 
or available habitat on the landscape. That information is in a different webinar that you can go to our website and find in a different one where we talk about those research results. And I think um, next month in July, we're gonna be doing, uh, we have a webinar scheduled with the US Geological Survey, where we're gonna talk specifically about those results that compared bee and butterfly habitat fund plantings to other things. And we're really excited about that, but know that it is the best of the best. And again, if you go back to one of those foundational thoughts at the start of the webinar, and that is that the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund has decided when we get an acre of habitat, we have to make it the best it can be. We can't afford to have just kind of, yeah, it's okay, it's better, better than nothing. It has to be the best it can be. It's too important not to be. Well, Pete, I think we can probably wrap this up with one last question. And, and I had a, a couple of folks uh, type this one in, and it's a it's it's one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, uh, here's the question as worded: I've been working to try and provide pollinator habitat for years. Do you have any suggestions on how to convince others to do the same? Mm -hmm. Well, so one of the a <clears throat> couple of thoughts, you know, um, if you go to uh, I'm gonna slide to this, the challenge that um, we kind of had for everybody. Um, there's a number of things that we have listed in here about, you know, sharing information and that sort of thing. But the other thing, Elsa, is remember that pollinator habitat is that unique glue that can connect all kinds of things. So if your neighbor is uh, I'll never be a beekeeper. I'm worried about being stung and that sort of thing. They might still very well be very interested in pollinator habitat because they care about water quality or soil health or monarch butterflies or the food that they eat. It is a topic that has the opportunity to really join many, many, many diverse interests. So that topic is and being able to look at uh, photos of all kinds of flowers and that sort of thing is always something that I think brings people together. So being able to have that conversation and share these resources with folks. You know, you have a neighbor that might be interested, hand them a seed of legacy flyer. We'll be happy to get them to you. Um, you know, start following us and sharing things on your social media. If you have a Facebook account and you're interested in bees and flowers and all that kind of stuff, you need to be following the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund Facebook page. Like something, share that with your friends. That's a great, easy way to kind of get that word out there. And remember, if you have a solar energy project that's coming into your community, your county, your state, your region, be that person that raises your hand and asks the question, hey, are, are we going to have pollinator habitat associated with that project? And we'd be happy to be a resource to that solar developer to talk about how we might be able to help them and make that happen. I think that's a great point, Pete, as we, as we uh, kind of wrap this up for the night, that we're happy to help you get these things started in your communities. You know, that is, uh, you know, if you can help us make the connections, we can work with the, the solar developer, the, the college, the um, corporate campus near you. We can do those things and we're, and we're more than happy to help. And so to get started, Pete, what would you recommend for folks? And then if you don't mind wrapping us up for the evening, I think uh, that's the last of our questions. Yep, well, here's the contact information again. Elsa is our habitat uh, program coordinator. She's the expert. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, talented people that are involved in the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. And we're passionate about working with folks to get great pollinator habitat on the landscape um, and to make sure that uh, it's gonna be a great success for you. So tonight was the presentation 
from the group that you've never heard of before called the Bee and Butterfly Habitat Fund. We hope that you become one of our new friends and that we're getting great habitat on the landscape. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time tonight, and uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Good night.